What impact is coronavirus having on the world's climate? And with planes grounded, industrial production reduced, and emissions declined, are there lessons the pandemic can teach us about living with nature moving forward? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Michelle Carey. India's capital is one of the world's most polluted cities, but its skies have turned blue. And many people can see the Himalayan mountains for the first time. And Italy's Venice, canal water is so clear, fish can easily be seen. All this is an unexpected upside of the coronavirus crisis. And it's proved global air quality can be dramatically improved and fast. The change has been created by lockdowns that have grounded flights and shut down factories. But environmentalists warn it could be only temporary. Climate talks have been delayed to next year because of the outbreak, and it's feared countries could prioritize human and economic welfare before that of the environment. Many are questioning whether the world will just go back to business as usual when it recovers from this pandemic. Let's hear what Japan's environment minister had to say. If we gave priority unconditionally to economic recovery while neglecting the environment, it would virtually mean a death of the Paris Accord. No one at the Environment Ministry disagrees that the economy is important. We just would like to behave in a way that the environment will never be left behind. Since COP26 has been postponed, we now have enough time to make a second nationally determined contribution before the summit with the newest data and facts. Japan takes this postponement as a positive development and will strive to create the situation where we can take part in COP26 with our heads held high. So let's have a look at how much air quality has changed during the lockdowns. India's capital, New Delhi, has seen a 70 percent drop in both nitrogen dioxide pollution and tiny so-called PM 2.5 particles. In China, carbon emissions dropped by almost 20 percent between February and March. And the use emissions have fallen below 60 percent compared to levels before the crisis. Fossil fuel pollution dropped by 30 percent in the northeast of the U.S. in March. Let's bring in our guests now from Paris, Francois Germain, Professor of Environmental Geopolitical and Migration Dynamics at the Paris Institute of Political Studies. From Penang is Mina Rahman, Environmental Lawyer and Coordinator of Climate Change Program at the Third World Network. And from New Delhi, Arunab Ghosh, CEO of the Council on Energy, Environment and Water. Thank you um, all for joining me. Um, Pope Francis said when talking about the pandemic, he said, I don't know if these are the revenge of nature, but they are certainly nature's responses, what the world is, is going through now. What role has how we treat the planet played in the spread of this pandemic as you see it, Francois? I would say obviously that the origins of the virus are to be found in the destruction of biodiversity, the, the, the simple fact that wine animals are coming closer to man settlements uh, actually uh, makes it easier for the virus to jump from the animal to the man. And, and actually about three quarters of the new emerging infectious diseases we see with humans are zoonoses, meaning that they've been transmitted uh, from animals. Uh, but this being said, even though there is a lot of things that we can say about the origin of the virus and the need to protect better biodiversity in order to protect us from uh, pandemics, I think we shouldn't be uh, saying that this is a revenge of, of nature and we sh should, I think, pay attention not to imagine that this is a message that nature is sending us. Uh, that virus is not good for anyone and will do no good for the climate, for nature or for biodiversity. So I would uh, worry ourselves uh, against that type of narrative, because at the end of the day, I think that the pandemic might have devastating consequences for the climate and for the environment at large. All right. Uh, Mina, your thoughts on this. What what role is, is what we have done and are doing to the planet um, played in the spread of this pandemic? Well, uh, partly, of course, it's due to wildlife trade. I think um, for my own organization and the national group that I belong to, uh, which is Friends of the Earth Malaysia, we have been for a long time calling an end to wildlife trade and consumption of um, wildlife meat. 
Uh, and so this is a case where we clearly saw the crossing of the species barrier from the wild to the human population. And given the fact that we are living in such a globalized world, so much of air travel and so much of interconnectedness, the way in which the impact of the coronavirus unfolded clearly showed that in this globalized world, um, the impacts are uh, severe, that it crosses all boundaries, all barriers, and no country is spared. So this is a lesson for us. And I think the Pope's message in terms of maybe the wrong, maybe, maybe he used the word revenge, but actually it's No, a actually, no, Mina, Mina, Mina just to be clear, viruses to come. just one sec, I almost Sorry. said this to Francois. To be clear, the Pope said, I don't know if these are the revenge of nature. He, 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 he uh, didn't really like that language, but I think he was just trying to draw um, a, an interconnectedness between um, our actions and the result. But I agree, revenge is a, is a strong word, but carry on. Yeah, but I think the 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 call that I mean the the point about the world being so connected globally um, and the ramifications being uh, so severe, just one country starting with one crisis and that emanating to be a global crisis. I think that's the lesson for us all. Uh, Arunava, what would you say about the connection between our actions, uh, our actions toward the planet, and what is happening now? Well, Rochelle. Um First of all, what we do to um, the planet will eventually come back uh, and, and uh, affect us. Whether we use the word like revenge or not, I think nature, what it does is it course corrects. And what we were doing was veering it off the course, uh, the violation of biodiversity limits, the violation of human wildlife separation, the violation of the kinds of food habits that we seem to have propagated. Uh, now, all of these will eventually result in some kind of course correction. That's the first thing. But the second thing is, is not just what we do to the planet and what planet does back to us, but what is it that we will end up doing to each other? And that is what this crisis is um, kind of playing out for us, almost as an experiment at a global scale, um, that if we uh, don't fix the, the nature of our lifestyles, the, the patterns of our production and consumption, um, the ways in which we understand the syncretic uh, relationship between humans and the rest of the ecosystem, uh, we will have a situation where our own systems, our economic systems, our social systems, our political systems, are going to get severely uh, strained. And, and the current pandemic is just the start of something that, uh, that might unfold into much larger uh, dimensions than we've foreseen so far. Francois, were you surprised at how immediate and drastic some of the changes were to the environment once there was this big timeout on, on all of this pollution? Well, I, I wasn't really surprised. Uh, th these are things that we knew uh, from uh, from models and from studies, but obviously this uh, crisis is also a kind of real life experiment of the influence of human activities on the climate and more globally on the environment. Uh, I was more surprised at the pace of reaction from the governments. Uh, and I think that a great lesson here is that when we face an imminent danger, after all, we are able to take drastic, radical and extremely costly measures to prevent ourselves from that danger. Now, the question we need to ask ourselves is why are we so much more afraid of the coronavirus than we are of climate change or of biodiversity loss? I think that's a great point, Mina. Um, people that, that talk about climate change often try to use the word emergency, and, and some people do and some people don't. But obviously, the world and governments are reacting this way to the pandemic because it is seen as an emergency. Um, do you think that this might finally get people to understand that climate change is also an emergency? Well, I think, yes. I think uh, we have we are now living in a totally unprecedented time. And I think, for one, the positive impact, if you can call it that, is that many people around the, I mean, around where we are in my part of the world, um, are normally during this time, we would be subject to severe transboundary haze. Uh, that's not happening this time around. There are clearer skies, cleaner air, rivers are far more clearer. Um, and so the irony, as somebody said, is that 
this is the time you should be breathing clean air, but we have masks on. So I think the awareness has, has, has come in the sense that we have to deal with, we cannot wait for pandemics and emergencies, that we have to respond in the right time and have the right policies in place. And I agree with the, uh, the previous speaker uh, from India in relation to re-examining the production systems and the consumption patterns, how everything is out of sync. And we have been, this, this warning actually that Mother Earth is giving, that we cannot live the way we have been living and we have to change dramatically. And I think many people have also discovered that if you now, families are sitting together, eating together, cooking together, playing together, things that they never did before. Um, so in a sense, we are rediscovering what it means to live um, in a community that is really communal rather than flying around all the time or consuming all the time and rushing around as if we uh, there's no limit um, to what we do. I think there are some very important lessons. Okay, um, Arunaba, let me, let me bring you in on this because this is certainly, I don't know if exposed or revealed is the right word, but, but it's shown what can happen when there is the political will to do something and that um, certain political parties that you are, for example, even the Republicans and Democrats getting together in the U.S. to agree on a $1,200 a month stimulus. It, it's not a lot and there may need to be more, but this, t there's a time that you never would have seen certain parties doing the things they're doing. Do you see this as a moment that um, governments and politicians might end up pleasantly surprising you? Well, I'm not surprised, Rochelle. It's uh, uh, because the nature of the of the crisis is so evident and so here and now that the extent of the the response. I mean, some countries have acted faster, some have acted later, but in general, the extent of the response is not surprising. What uh, would be an open question still is whether we let a uh, a crisis go to waste. And obviously, no one would wish uh, mass human suffering uh, to get ourselves to come out of our uh, sanguine positions and our, and our stupor of inaction. So what is it that will move us from responding to the current crisis to understand that we need a systemic change? And I think that is about what is it that we want to avoid? Because when we think about what is it that we do, we then... Uh, whether at a national level or at, through international negotiations, we always ask each other, well, why don't you act first and then I'll act later? Why don't you contribute money first and then I will contribute later? And we end up in this inertia of inaction. Whereas if we changed our focus towards a risk lens, issues that have very low probabilities, but have, if they came true, have catastrophic impacts, then our focus entirely changes towards what is it that we want to avoid? We want to avoid pandemics. We want to avoid extreme weather events. We want to avoid major crop losses. We want to avoid major water stress. When we begin to put our minds towards that, then what you see as a current response might actually become a more systemic response. Okay. That no, we will not act in a way that is entirely only self-centered and selfish because we are all having have a common interest in avoiding a common disaster. Um, Francois, you would hope that um, the countries, the richer countries, would lead on something like this. I mean, with climate change, pandemics and such are, are, are much more difficult on, on poorer countries, on poorer communities, uh, lower socio... So, but we have not seen that, obviously, particularly with President Trump in the U.S. We have not seen the U.S. taking the lead on this. Who can and will? Clearly not. I also would like to hope that this would be a kind of turning point in the way we think about climate change or about uh, the environment at large. Uh, but I'm afraid that we're missing out a fundamental point here. And that point is that the virus is not the climate. These are very different problems from one another. And we cannot just hope that we could replicate the same measures against climate change as the one that we take against uh, the coronavirus. Uh, against the virus, we can hope that the measures we take to protect ourselves we will have an immediate effect for ourselves. For climate change, this will be a long-term effect affecting people we don't know very often. And in that sense, climate change is not a crisis. There will be no return to normal. There will be no vaccine against climate change. 
sea level will not come down, temperature levels will not come down, there will not be a kind of post-crisis time. Uh, climate change is an irreversible transformation of the Earth. And the reason why we accept drastic measures against the coronavirus is because we know that they will not last very long, because we know that there will be a return to normal at some point. With climate change, okay, there will not be a return to normal, and therefore we need long-term measures that we can sustain uh, in the long run. Okay, uh, and therefore I think that we shouldn't make a mistake of thinking that we can do exactly the same Understood. against climate change. Uh, uh, we're doing right now. Understood. Arunab, I saw you, saw you kind of want to get, wanting to get in there. I mean, he, he does make a good point that it's easier to get people to buy in to these current restrictions because we know at some point it's going to end. It may be a few months. We don't really know how long. And, and you'll, you'll see the results because the results will be that you survived and that hopefully your family survived. Approaching climate change is a little bit different, is it not? I agree and I disagree. If you use the language of climate change, then yes, we end up thinking only about our children and our grandchildren, and then we say, well, I'm going to wait, out, uh, wait it out a little bit longer and see what happens, even though I profess interest in my grandchildren's welfare. But if you use the language of climate risks, which is very much here and now, there are farmers in India who are suffering of, because of climate change today. There are, there are communities along the coast around the world, including uh, where uh, Mina comes from, which are getting affected right now by uh, coastal, uh, uh, I mean, the ingress of seawater. Uh, so when we start applying a risk lens, then we see that, yes, while the over, overall changes that we have wrought about in the climate are irreversible, as Francois was saying, but the response need not be something that I can only think about 30 years from now. We can actually begin to organize ourselves around the immediate actions that are needed at the national level, at the international level, but particularly at the community level to increase resilience, okay. to, incre to focus on adaptation. Let, okay, let me ask Mina about that though. Mina, the types of things that, the type of change that Arunab was talking about, doesn't it require citizens and voters and communities to put pressure on leaders to, to do something? Oh, certainly. I think uh, you started by talking about, um, you know, Donald Trump and uh, the Democratic Party getting together on the, the stimulus package and the recovery. I think that if we use the stimulus and the recovery for the wrong purposes or for business as usual, for instance, if we are going to be bailing out the oil companies or the coal companies and so on and carry on with business as usual, this is really short term and short sightedness. What we should be doing, at least the rich countries where the money is available, that they should be moving into, um, re, you know, sustainable consumption, uh, sustainable co production systems, renewable energy, and not bail out the corporations that have been destroying the world um, and that have led to the crisis, multiple crises, not just the, the health crisis, but the environmental and the climate crisis. The drivers are quite similar. Um, for developing countries, though, I think the challenge is much more greater because um, a recent study by the UN um, has already shown that the COVID uh, response requires $2.5 trillion for developing countries to cope. Now, where you have very limited budgets, developing countries are not going to be able to do their climate response as a first step. They will have to respond to the inequality, the poverty, the basic needs, the health, and so on. So you do require global cooperation of an unprecedented scale, like a global Marshall Plan. Um, but I don't see that happening in the Trump era. Um, but it has to be a different kind of global response, which responds to the poor first, because the people who are, who are burdened by the crisis, the health crisis, and all the crises are the poorest. So now okay. we are faced with debt burdens in developing countries, and they are not going to be able to talk about climate or talk about, although, although the risk is there, but it's surely, it, it's, it's a clear-cut case of lack of resources. So, so there must be climate finance of a massive scale to help them, apart from the trillions needed to help them cope with the unprecedented impacts right now. So is that about, when we're, Francois, when we're talking about the, the amount of money that it would take to make this systemic um, change, is this about convincing businesses that this is actually in their best interest? 
Well, money is obviously uh, an issue, an important dimension, but I think that really the, the, the crux of the problem at the moment is international cooperation. International cooperation is in tatters right now. We have a global crisis, but many national responses extremely different from one another, with countries closing their borders, countries stealing masks from one another. Uh, and clearly, I don't see where international cooperation and international organizations will be going after this crisis. And I'm really worried that at the time when climate change will need increased international cooperation, clearly our institu in international institutions are considerably weakened after this crisis. COP26, uh, the climate change negotiations has been postponed. Uh, and I don't see all countries could focus again on fighting climate change they, when they will be focusing on their own economic recovery. Uh, you can discuss whether or not it's useful to close borders to stop the spread of the virus, but closing the borders will certainly not stop the spread of climate change. Um, Arunaba, you talked about, in some of the notes I've seen, this um, the social contract needing to be questioned or changed. And I think that's happening in, in a lot of countries. There are people that are realizing, you know, I lose my job, I lose my health insurance, you know, maybe at least questioning, is this okay that my country is built this way? Let's, let's ask some tough questions. Does the fact, does you expecting your, your country, your government, your tax dollars to go to also um, not destroying the planet, is that something that needs to be renegotiated in the social contract as well? I think we certainly need a new social contract. And what I've been uh, arguing for is a social contract that rests on uh, squaring what is considered to be um, an impossible trinity of jobs, growth, and sustainability. Most countries think that only two of these three things can be achieved. But in the current crisis gives us an opportunity to actually upend that assumption. How do you go about doing that? Through very concrete measures, notwithstanding the resource constraints that Nina has already pointed out. We know that there is going to be a loosening of monetary policy across the world. The world's central banks will open up. Now, that will reduce interest rates. Um, and we have to make sure that that reduced interest rate debt goes towards the kind of investments in the kind of infrastructure which is more climate friendly, more sustainable, but tend to have high upfront costs. And by lowering that cost of the debt, you actually make it more feasible. Second, many countries, rich and poor, will have some kind of a fiscal stimulus. Now, again, where do you deploy that fiscal stimulus? You deploy it towards not just um, uh, you know, saving the, the older industries, but actually underwriting some of the uh, investments in the newer sustainable industries, which also tend to have much more uh, uh, employment potential. For instance, distributed renewables, for instance, natural farming, for instance, uh, uh, new forms so, of uh, 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 producing what, real, consumer goods. Real quickly, so you're, what you're saying, and I do want you to finish your point, but it sounds like what you're saying, these are things that could actually um, not just benefit the environment, these benefit societies as well. There's jobs that go with these things you're exactly. talking about. Exactly. So, that, And that was going to be my, my final point on that issue, that unless we can reorient our structure of the economy, not just from high carbon to low carbon, but from exclusive to inclusive, exclusionary to something that brings in the labor force into this new sorts of investment, any kind of measure, whether for old industries or new industries, is not going to succeed. And we've got to make sustainable development something that is much more people-centered than we've attempted so far. If we don't do that, the social contract will fall apart even before we've, we've initialed it. That will be... The final word. I think that's a good place to end it. I'm sure, I hope we, we continue this discussion. Thanks to all of you for, for joining me. I appreciate it. Francois, Jemaine, um, Mina Raman, and Arunava Ghosh. Thank you all. And thank you for watching. You can see the program again anytime. Go to our website, aljazeera.com, for further discussion. You can go to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Rochelle Carey, and the entire team here. Bye for now.